joining us again for a very important discussion about reopening our schools. Today is August 13th. I'm Joseph Hockwriter, Superintendent, and I'm joined by members of our administrative team, Enrique Catalan, Dr. Margaret Ruller, Laura Nyer, Anthony Merlini, and Lisa Shookman. I uh, want to review the format for today and I uh, want to thank everyone for uh, giving us some input and feedback with regards to their experience yesterday. Uh, yesterday was our first forum and the goal was to give everyone uh, a big picture view of what returning to schools looks like in the Hendrick Hudson School District. So today, uh, briefly, we're going to overview the concept of a phased-in model. Last night at the Board of Education meeting, I presented the concept of phasing in students to Hendrick Hudson as we prepare to open the school year, and I'll get into that in a little bit. We're going to review and answer questions that were submitted that are obviously not part of this presentation. And if you have follow-up questions today, please send them to superintendent at henhudschools.org. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give a brief update and overview uh, our administrative team is going to answer questions uh, that you submitted and then if you have follow-up questions to what you hear today or uh, the answers that our team will provide, we will read those and we will respond to those during this meeting in real time. So please send those to the email address superintendent at henhudschools.org. Uh, we're budgeting uh, a little over an hour and 15 minutes for today's conversation. Uh, we believe we'll be able to address all of your needs and hopefully get your questions answered. If not, we have another parent forum on Monday, and we'll be announcing a schedule for additional parent forums to talk about particular topics uh, either tomorrow or early next week. The conversation about uh, reopening schools is a very important one. I, d I uh, shared parts of these slides uh, yesterday with regards to uh, we have a very passionate community and uh, we're actually lucky that everyone's passionate and uh, really eager to understand where our district is going in light of opening schools in a pandemic. Uh, the governor has allowed schools uh, to provide parent and student choice in terms of remote learning or hybrid learning. Uh, it's really the first time in public education that we have been asked from a policy standpoint to break away from what traditional school looked like September to June, 8 o'clock to 3 o'clock, and everyone attending public schools in actual physical buildings. We know that public health professionals and experts have weighed in on how to reopen schools in a pandemic. The county and state Department of Health have played a vital role as well as the Center for Disease Control. We've received a lot of guidance from those agencies as well as the State Education Department, but we also know that, we also know that there is incredible pressure, and that pressure is time because school opens in a few short weeks, and that's uh, today's discussion. What we hope uh, is that this situation is temporary. Um, we were thrust into online learning last March. We had two days to prepare for it, and we know that we have hurdles to overcome, but we also know that we were wildly successful. We took your feedback to what online learning experiences your students had, and we've worked with teachers all spring, we've worked with teachers all summer, and we'll continue to do that to perfect our craft as we rebuild and reimagine schools. So to begin this conversation, it's around expectations and that returning to school in September, as we said yesterday, is not synonymous with a return to normalcy. Schools and the school experience for staff, for students, for all of us, is not going to be what it was. It can't be because of the pandemic that we're in, because of the health concerns that we have, and the other safety measures that schools now will have to embrace. We have new responsibilities about how we educate students and how we keep them safe. So the question is, can we reopen schools in a phased approach? Uh, Governor Cuomo had a phased approach to reopening New York State. Should the Hendrick Hudson School District also adopt a phased approach to reopening schools? This is a conversation in our region. It's a conversation locally. A number of school districts recently in Dutchess County, not far away in Middletown uh, and Monroe Woodbury, as well as Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Massachusetts have all embraced a phased in approach. And essentially what that means is school will begin a little bit differently 
Over time, different groups of kids will come into the schools to be acclimated, while other students uh, have implemented and begun their remote learning plan. And then at a fixed date, as long as we have our uh, approval by the governor to open up uh, because of the rate of infection and, and the calculation that he has, we would welcome all students to school for those that choose it. Uh, as you know, last week we announced a remote learning option for families that choose that. Uh, we have just under 200 families uh, who have indicated uh, that they would like their child to begin the school year in the remote option. So what would the phases look like? Phase one, we're considering confidence and readiness. And the dates are italicized and they're in blue because those are target dates. Those are for right now planning purposes. Uh, these aren't set in stone. In fact, we're meeting uh, with our staff and their union leadership and other leaders uh, to see if we need to open school differently, if we need to open it earlier, or if these dates might actually work for us. The idea is that in phase one, our staff return for significant and detailed training. The CDC and Department of Health has increased the number of uh, training mechanisms and modules that all staff will need to complete. More training than opening any other school year. We also would finalize our staffing needs, and that's important to underscore because we have a number of staff who have COVID-related uh, health issues where they may not be able to join us in the fall and we're going to have to replace them or they will have to be on medical leave and we're going to have to deal with that. We would have district-wide safety training and I put in parentheses construction. Remember all of our schools endured significant construction this year. In 2018 the community passed just shy of a $20 million bond to increase our security infrastructure, uh, basically redesigning the main entrances at three of our four schools as well as other needed upgrades. There will need to be training on those mechanisms as well. Uh, we will refine our remote learning curriculum. We have heard you loud and clear uh, that although many students had a great experience, uh, some parents wished their students had a different experience, and we own that, and we hear you, and we're working to correct that. At last night's board meeting, you heard our administrative team talking about the number of trainings and the breadth and depth of professional development available to our teachers this summer so they can perfect and, and improve their craft, especially with regards to remote learning. This also would allow schools to implement their school-specific protocols and systems. No two schools in our, dis in our district are alike, and their school safety plan and other mechanisms need to uh, take into account each school's own DNA. Phase two is what we're calling connection and application. Starting September 14th, again, a target date for our internal planning purposes, all students would begin remote learning. It's really important that we get this right and that we get it right early. And the reason we need to get it right and get it right early is because there are going to be multiple times throughout the school year that we move from an in-school schedule to a remote schedule. The CDC has provided guidelines that if students or staff test positive, they will help us identify whether or not we need to close school, if so for how long, quarantine certain students, uh, or a particular part of the building. They will advise us on that. So it is highly, highly likely it is very probable that during the year we will move multiple times from our in-school learning model to our remote learning model. By starting uh, students in the remote mo model, we'll make sure that we're ready. We can work out any kinks. We can make sure that students are ready and understand their expectations. Our remote learning model plan that's on our website is very specific and explicit in terms of student and teacher expectation. Live scheduled instruction every day, attendance will be taken, grades will be calculated. It's important that those accountability measures are in place and it's important that those accountability measures are practiced. It will also allow us time to train our students on new health protocols as well as parent and family training on a number of matters that we are required to from the CDC and Department of Health. Uh, the daily health screening, where parents have to attest that their child is healthy, is not running a fever, and is not symptomatic. These are all new processes and protocols, new to public schools. For the first time ever, we are going to be implementing medically proven processes and protocols to open our school year. It will be different, 
and we need that time to make sure we get it right. Phase three, we're calling acclimation and preparation. And again, target dates uh, around the third week of September into early October. That's where we would phase in students. We want to make sure our kindergartners and first graders get into schools, that they meet their teacher, their principal, they understand the protocols, they understand where to go, how to ask for help, uh, but also understand the new systems in the classroom. Kindergartners have not stepped foot in our schools. By now, we would have kindergarten orientation and different activities in the three schools, and we can't because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Providing this sort of time allows schools, staff, and parents to plan and allows us to execute those traditional and very, very important initiatives while doing it in a safe and a health conscious environment. Our special education students would attend. This would be our ABC and Sailor students, our special class students, our self-contained students. Also our sixth and ninth graders. Think about that. Our sixth graders and ninth graders have not had an orientation experience this summer. We need to provide that for them. They need to understand the ropes and the methods and the rhythm of how the middle school and high school works. And this phase would provide time for that. Also, in some meetings today with our teachers, a number of teachers expressed interest in having their grade levels come in on a rotating and scheduled basis. So we certainly would look at the schedule to account for that. So while students would be learning remotely, we also would be providing multiple opportunities for them to come into the building to meet their teacher and understand the new systems and protocols in a very scheduled and in a very safe way. And finally, phase four would be execution. Our target date would be October 5th, and that's when school is fully in schedule. This would be for the middle school and high school, our hybrid model. And at the elementary school, all students K through five will be invited in. This would not include the families who choose to be online or, or choose the remote option for uh, the first semester. And we'll get into uh, questions around the remote learning plan. There are, there are many of them and we'll get to those uh, very shortly. So we're going to now move into our Q&A session. These are questions that were provided uh, by families uh, last night and today uh, before 10 a.m. Uh, many of them are repeats, so if we don't uh, answer all of them line by line, it's because we felt comfortable that we previously did. Um, there are questions regarding all the various tenants of planning to return to school, so we're going to adjust to that portion of the presentation and just give us a second. Okay, uh, we're going to move, as you can see on your screen, we have our questions divided up by topic. Uh, so we're going to uh, move through this um, as quickly as we can to make sure we can get to some questions that are uh, coming into the email address. So the first question, uh, and the only question regarding budget, uh, that our presentation yesterday stated that approximately $50,000 uh, has been spent on mandated signage and related costs. Uh, question is, can we provide further detail? So Enrique Catalan is with us, our Assistant Superintendent for Business, who can uh, provide some additional information. Yes, thank you. Approximately, we have spent $50,000, and that includes signages, uh, the CDC, the, the Department of Labor, every different governmental authority has asked us to put posters about what we can do about uh, FMLA, uh, rights of the employees, rights of the children, um, in every single bathroom and in every single uh, place we need to we need to put a poster showing what we should do to avoid COVID, washing hands, etc., etc. So we have a lot of uh, posters that we will we have been preparing um, we will continue to prepare to be ready to be within the law uh, also we have other costs that are mandated we need to teach 
we need to teach uh, custodians, drivers, how to prepare if they, they see a, a student who they think has COVID or is ill, um, nurses, teachers. So there's a lot of related costs uh, that we will have to spend in consultations and in preparation for starting school. Thank you. All right, we'll go to questions regarding COVID. Um, <clears throat> elementary school student will have a full in-person schedule, as I understand. Uh, the rationale for having them in person with a full schedule when they can spread the virus and get sick, albeit at a lower rate. So uh, we're actually fortunate, unlike some other districts, um, we have additional classroom space, we have large classrooms, uh, we also have uh, additional staff who are certified teachers as well as they are special educators or reading teachers. The idea was to bring in elementary students uh, for as long of a duration as we could. Um, we don't have uh, the capacity uh, issues or concerns that we do at the middle school and high school. For example, middle school and high school students transition and move all about the building. Uh, students at the elementary level are going to be uh, mostly um, operating out of their classrooms or within a particular wing of the building. Uh, the safety information that led to that decision was uh, it, it was about space and whether or not we invited all of our elementary students back or half or two-thirds. Uh, all families will need to complete the screening um, to make sure that they're, uh, to make sure they attest that their child is, is healthy and not showing symptoms. Uh, and again, we're one of the few districts that um, can do this in a, in a safe and responsible way. Will there be any testing and tracing for teachers, staff, and students? There will be tracing if uh, students, staff, or teachers uh, test positive. Uh, the Department of Health uh, will coordinate um, that activity. Uh, the district will not be testing anyone. The district is not certified or qualified, nor do we have uh, the staff to do that. <clears throat> uh, the staff that, that uh, serve as our, as our nurses have other responsibilities. Um, and so the district, like many others, are partnering with the Department of Health uh, to identify testing centers and uh, uh, places where, where folks can get tested. If one signs the consent for 100% remote learning, will, be that, will there be an option for January to change to hybrid? We're contemplating the example. Uh, so on and so forth. Okay, so the idea with uh, families committing for the first semester was so that we don't have a revolving door of students that are home and that come back or perhaps they leave again. For students who start in a hybrid model and there are concerns or just a family decision, it's easier to leave the classroom and go home rather than from the classroom back into the building. Remember, we're looking for a commitment from families so we can prepare our staffing accordingly. And that if we have a free flow of movement going between basically two instructional models, uh, that is going to disrupt our staffing model and uh, we can't afford to be making adjustments in staffing or reallocating students by section uh, in the middle of the semester. So that was the idea uh, with, with moving it to the semester. Uh, and yesterday, Wednesday's presentation, uh, we had a Q&A with the uh, Department of Health. I understand HIPAA prevents the districts knowing infectious versus absentee. I expect we must have an absentee threshold at which we, which we will pull the plug as a parent who favors in-school learning but acknowledges we are, likely, we are unlikely to make it all year without retreating to remote. Yeah, this is a, this is a real concern. Um, is absenteeism. Uh, last night, I, I encourage you to check into last night's presentation. Uh, Laura Nyer and Enrique Catalan, who have responsibilities with regards to HR and employee relations, uh, shared the reality that we have staff that uh, uh, are, are nervous um, of contracting the disease or, or may have uh, immune deficiencies that make them susceptible. 
Um, it is very likely that if we have a significant number of teachers or any staff, it could be bus drivers, custodians, um, that we cannot transport or provide quality instruction or uh, make sure that our schools are safe and clean, we may need to transition to the remote model for that day. And that's why I, I, I uh, wanted to be crystal clear in what I said earlier is that we have to be ready to float and move fluidly between a remote model and an in-school model because there are a lot of factors uh, that will necessitate us moving and absenteeism is, is one of them for sure. Uh, and we answered this question, will, will teachers and staff be tested for COVID before school begins? Not by the district. If uh, staff wish to, um, they can do that uh, on their own. We do know that staff are traveling. Uh, we, had a, we had a couple meetings today with some teachers who were traveling because their children are going to college and uh, they're, they're driving through states unavoidable that are on the governor's uh, quarantine list. So um, the way the, this infection spreads and the rate at which it can spread, um, we encourage everyone to, to get tested if they feel ill, but the district will not be testing. Let's go to special ed, Greg. I think we only had one there. Special Ed, uh, can you articulate what PT will look like in the elementary schools, specifically for students that have a Building 504 plan? So Lisa Shookman is our Executive Director of PPS. She is with us, and I'll allow her to respond to that question. So there won't be any changes um, to the service. The service will go on just as it normally would. Um, we will be very careful if we have to group students in a small group. We will make sure it's always a small group from the same area. So we can trace where kids have been. So students, any related service, OT, PT, speech, counseling, will continue the way it has in the past. Um, we may do a little bit more pushing in sometimes, but we will follow their IEP. Okay. Do you have any other questions that have come in, Mr. Hopper, or is your email for special ed? Uh, not yet. Yes. Okay, great. Let's go to transportation. Uh, will schools permit parents to drop off children before buses uh, to lessen the number of people entering at any one time? Yes. So uh, there were some other questions about staggering the start or dismissal time. Uh, we understand that many parents are going to want to drive their, their children for uh, very legitimate reasons. Uh, we're going to collect that data toward the end of the month so our transportation folks can develop their routing uh, system and, and mechanisms. Uh, so yes, we will uh, be working with the uh, principals to identify not only when parent drop-off and pickup will take place, but also where uh, on the five campuses. So we're aware of that. Uh, we also have consulted with uh, all of the law enforcement agencies to make sure that they are aware that we are going to have increased traffic in and around all five schools. Uh, they have committed that to the extent possible they're going to have extra um, law enforcement folks on hand and they may need to be doing some uh, traffic duty uh, but we do understand we are uh, acknowledging that we're going to have increased traffic flow in and around our schools and uh, the schools will uh, will prepare a schedule for target times for parent drop-off and pickup. Uh, at yesterday's presentation we talked about electric e electrostatic sanitizing. Uh, can you describe this method in more detail? So. Anthony Merlini is with us. He is our facilities director uh, and he's uh, familiar with this method and he'll provide some additional information. Okay, so um, for, to, for cleaning the buses with the electrostatic sanitizer, we have machines and we use them with uh, disinfectant um, and it creates electrostatic charge on the particles that are in the um, disinfectant and what that does is it enables them to um, adhere to a surface and find surfaces and go into nooks and crannies and crevices and around the back of them. Um, the product that we use has a kill of 45 seconds um, and that always depends on the product used. Some of the products have longer time, some products have lesser time, but the one we're using has a 45 second claim uh, when it's on the surfaces. Um, will we be able to do um, buses after every run? Probably not after every run. I don't think there's enough time to do that. Um, the transportation supervisor is not here today, but she can elaborate more on that. 
Um, but we've worked on that and tried to figure out a way that we could do things in the interim if we have time. Um, the plan is to clean after the morning runs and clean after the afternoon runs uh, with the electrostatic spray. Um, one of the other things that we are looking into um, securing is a antimicrobial product that after you clean all the surfaces, you can add this antimicrobial product that has a microscopic shield. And what that does is it adheres to um, smooth surfaces and rough surfaces, et cetera, all kinds of textures. And it provides this microbial shield that on these surfaces and has a 90-day um, kill claim. So it has these spikes that are in it. It's, you, it's microscopic, so you can't see them. But if a bacteria model comes into contact with them, it pierces it and it destroys it on contact. So those are little things that we're doing in the interim as well. Great. Thank you, Anthony. Um, let's go to remote learning, Greg. Thank you. There's a lot of a lot of questions on remote learning, but the first one is a HVAC uh, question. So Anthony is sure. is still with us. Um, HVAC systems must be aligned with standards set forth by the state, um, so on and so forth. Uh, so let's at least talk about HVAC systems, Anthony, and then I think the the rest are for um, we can take care of them. Sure. Um, HVA systems, I don't know why it needs to be. It's not in line with movie theaters, shopping malls, and other venues. It's guided by SED. The State Education Department dictates what we do inside of our buildings. Our buildings is, are designed, the systems are designed and approved by the State Education Department, and there's things that we can and we can't do based on what they allow us to do. Um, so. Uh, there's a lot of questions uh, coming up. I think there's a couple more questions coming up with uh, ventilation and HVAC systems and what we're doing there. Um, we're also going to use um, this antimicrobial shield inside um, our unit ventilators and um, HVAC equipment and things of that nature so we can help protect where we get um, uh, microbials inside of the bacteria inside of there to help kill them as they come through where we can use um, needlepoint bipolar ionization in our HVA systems, we're also going to use that. Where we can increase our filters to have a higher MERV rating, I've seen some other questions through here where we talk about a MERV 13. Um, generally most schools use a MERV 8, um, so they are talk about going to a MERV 13 or even higher. Um, where we can, uh, we will. Um, there are mechanical constraints and other factors that must be considered when you're changing filter um, MERV rating. So it's not just a slam dunk. You can't just move from one to the other without considering all the other parts and pieces of the HVAC system. So where we can, we'll do that as well. Um, there are upgrades that are happening to the HVAC systems district-wide. Um, coincidentally, when we had the bond uh, resolution, there are things in the bond um, that are addressing um, exhaust air, um, ventilation air. Uh, we are putting new units in um, furnace woods and for the unit ventilators. There's a couple other buildings that are getting um, new units here and there where the old units weren't uh, performing efficiently. Um, when we renovate our um, other spaces, the main offices and some of the other offices and nurses' offices and things of that nature, we are fixing the ventilation in those spaces as well. So there will be other things coincidentally that we'll be doing with HVAC through the bond. Thank you. Uh, other questions up there were around uh, basically protocols and procedures in the school, lockers, um, so on and so forth. So the principals are, are working on that. They're working on what the return to school plan looks like and what those protocols will be. Uh, we've asked for some, some medical advice, particularly with lockers. And uh, you know, the, the short answer is the less uh, time students spend in the hallway or in their locker, uh, the more beneficial it is or the safer environment that it creates. Um, we want to limit the amount of students who are congregating. We want to make sure that um, students don't have an opportunity to um, make some bad choices, uh, even though they, uh, you know, are really excited to be back in school. So there is a discussion about you know students carrying their backpack, 
especially at the secondary level. Um, students will only have three, four, maybe five classes uh, given the block schedule, so they'll have fewer classes to be focused for and to be prepared for. Uh, and I also know there have been discussions about students leaving uh, textbooks and other materials in the classroom rather than bringing them home with the exception of their, uh, of their laptop. Uh, looks like question three on this page, in-person school, if in-person school is offered and a parent does not elect to do virtual school at the beginning of the semester, can the parent elect to keep their child home and full virtual. So we answered that, yes, it's easier for, for families and students to move from in the classroom to out of the classroom. Uh, and if it's based on being uncomfortable with, with outbreaks or, or other things happening, um, we're not going to ask the reason. Uh, we're not asking the reason right now for parents that are choosing remote. Uh, the governor basically permitted that. so. Uh, we're, we're going with uh, his guidance, even though the guidance from the State Education Department was unclear, because we know there are concerns. We know that there, um, there are community concerns, and uh, we want to be able to make sure families can make those decisions based on uh, their own interests and the interests of their kids. Um, same thing, question four, same answer, yes, you'll be able to, to switch to remote learning. Is a hybrid plan an option for elementary? It's, it's not right now for the reasons we shared earlier that uh, we wanted to have elementary uh, kids in school on a daily basis. Uh, we know that um, it was a little tougher on them at the end of last year uh, being remote, so we want to make sure that we try to get them in uh, in, a, in a safe and responsible way, so that is why. And we also have the space and the staff for it. Again, many schools around us uh, are truncating and, and they're creating um, uh, options or uh, alternative days for elementary students to attend school. Uh, we have the luxury of space and resources that we don't have to do that. Uh, student In your remote plan, students will be viewing live instruction from home. I do not want my son filmed, nor do I consent. We agree with that. That's actually uh, in the education law. Uh, so if I'm a middle schooler or a high schooler uh, and I'm watching instruction from home, you'll be watching basically the, the teacher's uh, presentation. And a lot of the research coming out of the various organizations about what the digital experience should look like uh, while they're dialing into a classroom uh, is that they're basically mini lessons, 15 to 20 minute mini lessons or direct instruction to make sure all students receive the baseline and similar information and then those students can use some time in the remaining part of the block for independent practice and application. So students who are at the secondary level uh, who choose the remote option or during the hybrid schedule they are home, uh, that will be what their flow will look like. In a 70 or 80 minute block, uh, they will need to be there at the beginning for all of the accountability measures we talked about. There'll be some time for independent practice or maybe they'll work uh, with groups remotely and then uh, come back before the end of the block. Uh, question nine, we have, or number nine, we have a number of questions. Uh, what educational supports will be in place for parents who opt out of in-person learning for elementary age students? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So uh, yesterday, Laura Nyer was talking about many of our um, online applications or different uh, systems that we use. Laura, I don't know if you want to just quickly touch on uh, the different parent components on some of those so that parents can uh, be aware and in the loop and know how to support. Sure. Um, we have our uh, wonderful team of tech coaches. We have 20 tech coaches across the district that are um, teachers and staff um, that specialize in technology, and they've been working hard not only last spring, but this summer, and um, trying to improve and create some more resources specifically geared towards students and parents. Uh, way before this pandemic, we had been in the process, actually, of Training, using our tech coaches to train the public library on the Google Suite for Education and our next step was to do a training for PTA with a plan to then open it up to additional parents, knowing that the parents are a really key component in a child's learning. Um, that was way before this even happened, so that's already been something that we had the framework for, but now our tech coaches are really trying to finalize and tweak 
um, specific website uh, or one main website where, where students and parents can go to find the help they need as well as providing office hours for students and parents that they can reach a tech coach for um, help at specific times during the day. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's see. We're, okay, there we are. Well, uh, what will the schedule for remote learning and in-person learning uh, look like or would it be different? Uh, if you are at home and you are dialing into the course, you will follow your school schedule. So as a middle schooler and high schooler, you will follow your schedule, the, basically the bell schedule. So um, you'll be uh, following that uh, routine, but from home. At the elementary level, the expectation is that instruction follows the school day. Um, the idea is that, uh, that those routines remain the same. Uh, but again, remote instruction will look a little different, as I said, that there'll be some direct whole group instruction. There'll be many lessons with groups of kids. There'll be one-on-one -on -one time. But at various points throughout the day, uh, teachers and children by groups uh, or by class by groups or individually will be connecting uh, at a very regular and scheduled time frame. Uh, we're also, you know, since this is new to us, but it's a model that the region is embracing, uh, we're working with our BOCES to try to standardize that process and, and the schedule across many districts. And I'll let Margaret Roller jump in um, to, to give a little insight as to what the potential schedule could look like and uh, the conversations that are happening regionally with BOCES. So the elementary schedule, as you might imagine, we don't have an expectation that eight-year-olds would be online for the better part of their day. And as Joe uh, mentioned, that day would be broken up into some short whole class instructional sessions, mini lessons, uh, and then followed up by several short small group or one-on-one -on -one meetings with teachers around uh, the core academic subjects. In addition to that, we hope to be able to provide uh, specials along the way, uh, but we have no intention of having our young students spend 9 to 3 or 9 to 2.30ish, depending on your building schedule, sitting in front of a computer. There will be practice work, and we are working right now with teachers to look at the opening units of study and prepare practice work that will be appropriate to happen at home with um, some minimal supervision from parents not necessarily related to online performance, but perhaps, uh, I, won't, I hate to say worksheets, but some things that we can give the students to use manipulative to show what they've learned, reading and writing notebooks, etc. So that's the ongoing process that we're having right now. Great. And, and uh, Margaret's commentary took care of a couple of those questions um, as well as mine. So I'm going to go down to number six there. Uh, does the amount of funding allocated to each student in the district change? No, it doesn't. Um, the governor has permitted remote learning uh, as part of uh, a district's instructional plan. Um, and the state, while they didn't necessarily say that parents could have choice, they asked us to provide a remote learning plan. It's on our website. So no, uh, there, there will not be any, we don't anticipate any change in funding whether students are remote or in school. Uh, we appreciate knowing the results of parents' survey. Uh, teach, staff and teacher surveys, are teachers comfortable? So uh, with regards to teachers, the uh, teachers union have uh, completed a couple surveys with staff. That, that's information for, um, for them, uh, you know, given some of their own concerns or as an association in terms of advoca advocacy efforts. I can tell you that uh, our team who, who are on the call today have met with the teachers union representatives and, um, and many classroom teachers over the last number of weeks and months. And I think comfort level, uh, you know, it varies. It varies based on uh, health issues, personal health issues. It varies on uh, a number of things. Um, we know that we want to return to normal as, as best and as quickly as we can, but if it means we take some steps by starting virtually or phasing in, that will give us our best chance. I'll turn it over to Margaret again, uh, who has been uh, meeting with teachers quite frequently, uh, and she may be able to, to give a little window into uh, some of this thinking. Uh, 
Um, yeah, you know, teachers are concerned about what the day is going to look like, uh, whether we're live or we create that remote option, as you all know. We're taking the results of the parent surveys and looking at who's opting for remote, parsing that out, and then we will assign and build the remote program once we have uh, reached the date for those submissions. Uh, I don't know how else I can add to what Joe said. It was pretty thorough, so I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, number one, the form for online learning says August 24th. Yes, August 24th is a Monday, so families could have the weekend to think about it uh, as we're discussing the concept of starting remotely. Um, you know, will that be pushed back? It, it may. Um, there will be meetings that take place uh, before the decision or before the um, before the form needs to be completed. Uh, we're having a discussion tomorrow to look at our calendars to schedule those. Uh, over next week, we're uh, anticipating at least two meetings in each elementary school, uh, one during the day and, and one in the early evening to try to uh, uh, field as many questions and speak to as many folks as we can. Uh, we talked about, um, oh, the commitment period of a, of a semester, number three. You know, semester is, is basically mid-year, and uh, we chose mid-year because that's uh, especially at the secondary level when courses change, students who take um, uh, half-credit courses, that's usually when we flip those schedules for those students, so we wanted to be consistent in terms of uh, the elementary, uh, but also to give us time for those families, you know, maybe starting in around Thanksgiving time to, to see what their interest is in continuing or not. Because again, as students move from in-classroom to remote or vice versa, that will change our staffing pattern. And that is a very uh, significant concern um, because students, uh, we want to we promote classroom environment and uh, all of the um, social emotional things that, that make a healthy class environment. And if we have students moving uh, too frequently, it's going to throw our class sections off, and then we'll need to reshuffle some staff uh, in basically in the middle of a month or or uh, midway through a year. Uh, let's see. If I select the hybrid for my children now, switch to remote. Yep, we can do that. Number four. Uh, I read in one of the documents that a student whose parent has been exposed does not have to quarantine and they go to school. Is that correct? Well, that's up to the health department. They're going to uh, identify and let families know or any folks through contact tracing uh, what they should be doing, whether they should be going to school or not. Um, yes, doctors have asked if anyone has, has been exposed um, and to make sure precautions are taken, but that is a, a conversation and a, and a decision, a recommendation the health department in, in conjunction with the contract, contact tracers. Thank you for your efforts. This is a difficult situation. Okay, we appreciate that. Uh, not a question, but a statement, so thank you. Uh, if a parent signs the remote teaching option and something has to, something takes place, work job reason, um, will the child be allowed to enter school? I mean, you know, we understand that there are very, um, a number of different scenarios that would lead to, uh, you know, personal and professional life changes. Uh, I, I guess I would say we would need to look at those on an individual basis, but again, the goal is to um, separate students and to have students in different cohorts. So an uh, at-home cohort and an at-school cohort, but, but uh, those are things we would you know, have to take into consideration on an individual basis. Under the hybrid plan, can teachers opt to teach remotely because of medical reasons? What percentage of teachers have done so? Uh, will in-school students watch these teachers on the internet? How else will they fill a potential block of time? So um, this is an ongoing conversation that if, if there are staff that, I, that are identified too ill to report to work, um, do they have the option to work from home? That's going to be an ongoing conversation uh, we have. It's, it's, uh, we need to discuss wh what the intent of the law is and whether or not that's permissible. Uh, Laura Nyer has been, has been working on that. I know she's been working with our legal team. She's been working with her colleagues. 
uh, on on how to uh, how to handle that. She mentioned that a little bit yesterday, but as of now, it's it's one of those uh, circumstances out of the district's control. Um, but we may, you know, we may need to allow that based on the number of uh, of, of teachers, but um, it's unknown right now. Um, will in school students watch these teachers via the internet? Yeah, that's a question that if um, a science teacher is not at work and at home do the kids show up to school and then watch their teacher teach from from home that's a, a really good consideration we're going to have to um, we're going to have to think about that a little bit um, you know it's it's unknown because of uh, there are going to be many different situations so really the question is if if someone is not well to come to work can they stay home and work and what do we do with those students uh, in order for schools to close to understaffing, is there a percentage of staff? I don't think that there's a, a hard, fast percentage. It's about safety. It's about uh, making sure we can supervise students, whether or not we have a bench of substitute teachers or others that can uh, fill their place. Um, I think it's going to be a decision, to be honest, that we'll make in conjunction with each principal. Uh, every morning around 5 or 5.30 a.m., uh, many of us get a, an email sent to us about staff attendance and that's the first thing we look at when we wake up is the staff attendance for the day and I know the principals are always communicating with their office staff um, to fill vacancies to make sure subs are coming in so we would have to treat that the same way um, but there there may come times when uh, absenteeism uh, is so high that we cannot safely open school um, again, is there a percentage? There isn't. Uh, it's, it's going to be, do we have enough staff or do we have uh, other, other contingency plans where we could safely uh, instruct students for that day? Are the principals of each building directly involved in current planning? Uh, we haven't received emails. Uh, all of us on this phone call have been meeting regularly uh, with our principals. Uh, we have meetings with them throughout the week. Uh, on different topics and different uh, issues. We're all trying to solve these together. Um, I think you'll, you'll see a lot of information be coming out from those schools in the next coming days in terms of uh, what to expect as we reopen. If the district switches to remote learning only, uh, yep, we had, we had this, uh, this question already. Will they teach in their classroom? Um, yes. Uh, our expectation is that teachers report to work and they use the district resources uh, and, and supports to be able to teach remotely from their classroom. Uh, and yes, it might. Will their physical presence give them greater access? It might. Uh, Laura, you can touch on, on the tech end that we, we improved our bandwidth and, and some other matters if you want to touch on that briefly. Sure. Um, yes, yeah, knowing that we might have a lot more people streaming and connecting, um, we've doubled our bandwidth to one gig in the district, so that should be, we've been operating a half of that amount, so I'm pretty confident going forward we'll have what we need. Also, um, as many people know, all the students now have a um, touchscreen Chromebook that they can access, one for each student, as well as the staff. The instructional staff all also have 14-inch um, screen touchscreen Chromebooks with um, some larger swords so that they can um, work with their kids, work in the same environment and whatever that technology may be, um, and also still have the desktop computers that are in their classroom. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, what percentage of instruction will be in the form of online programs like iReady, iXL, and Puzzle? Uh, Margaret, do you want to touch on that? So routinely, whether we're in school in a normal year as we were at the beginning of last year or in this remote environment, we all across the district use programs like iReady, iXL, and other programs that supplement instruction at various times during the school day. So for argument's sake, if a teacher has finished direct instruction and children are now working in small groups, there may be a group of students that are on iXL in a content area or iReady. The work that kids are doing are not fillers. They are practice for the concept that they are still struggling with as students. Most of these programs are intuitive enough to know what a child, a specific child, that child that is logged in, needs to improve upon, and that's the type of questioning that is presented to the students. 
in addition to that, it also gives teachers uh, a lot of assessment information about how they're progressing, which then in turn influences some of the small group work. Great. Thank you. Um, number 17, will all previously planned course offerings still be available? Uh, yes, yeah, the middle school and high school are trying to schedule everything. Um, if courses don't offer, it's usually an enro a matter of enrollment. Um, will there be opportunities for individualized instruction, small group, reading groups? Uh, yes, if you're in, oh, well, Margaret, I'll, I'll let you handle that. Yes, that's the answer is yes. <laughs> Across all grade levels, there will be opportunities. And uh, I would say almost daily, if not daily, to work in small groups and often one-on-one -on -one with teachers to either continue questioning a topic or to look for extended uh, problem solving with people. Uh, it is the preferred method for remote instruction. I think a lot of people found that having the entire class on for any length of time wasn't as valuable as breaking them into small groups. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm going to pause here to let folks know who have joined us. Uh, if you have a follow-up question to what you're hearing, you may send it to superintendent at henhudschools.org. Uh, we've received the number. We're going to try to get through what we can. Um, so if you, if you hear something and you'd like additional information, please email superintendent at henhudschools.org. We're going to try to get to them uh, toward the end of the presentation. Um, I'm going to let, uh, uh, there are a number of questions here sort of chunked about um, remote and coming in and out. I think we answered those. Uh, I'd like Lisa Schuchman to, to answer. There's, there's a question embedded in number 20 about social emotional support. So Lisa, if you could expand on that a little bit and the, the work of your team. Sure. Um, I've been working with school counselors, social workers, and psychologists since, I believe, March or April, developing plans to um, assist our students as they return to our school. Um, we know that every kid, this is a trauma-based um, approach that we're doing, and that every child has been through something. They're afraid of school, or they're afraid of the public. So we really developed a lot of plans for PD, not only for students, but for staff. Um, and we plan on doing some parent night um, presentations. We'll do twice, I think, once during the day and once in the evening. Um, my hope is to take them for people that cannot attend one or both. Um, and we are setting up plans within the building. Um, we have forms that teachers will use to identify kids that are struggling to work with social workers or school counselor or psychologists. So, that is all in the works. The team is um, comprised of K to 12 uh, employees, and they have been working uh, tirelessly and uh, collectively with one another to develop plans for each building. Great. Thank you. Uh, Here's another one, uh, Lisa, number 26. My son has an IEP. There are different rules for him on the number of days to hit for him to attend school. So uh, if students have an IEP, um, what happens? We are trying to ensure that the students, um, K to 5, obviously, will attend every day. Um, but the middle school and high school having the Wednesday remote, everybody would be remote, and we're trying to ensure that all students can attend four days. The week. Again, that's going to depend on the schedules of the high schools and the middle schools, but um, we are working towards that so we can have them in school as much as possible, or we will have that live instruction um, happening with their special ed teacher. Right. It's really going to depend on the schedule of the middle school and high school. Thank you. Uh, number 27, I've heard there's a possibility of students who offer remote learning could end up having a teacher online who is not in their classroom. Well, this is true for the elementary piece. That's why. Um, you know, we're asking for a commitment, and we're asking for a commitment uh, on August 24th so that we could identify how many families by grade level, and particularly at the elementary school, because if there are enough families by grade level, and depending on, on that data, we may be able to assign a remote only teacher to that cohort of students. So, for example, if five students from Furnace Woods, five students from Frank G, and 12 students from BV, all third graders have indicated an interest in uh, remote learning, we may very likely will assign a teacher to that group of kids. 
Now, uh, there are other questions about, you know, how do we make sure that they're teaching the same thing at the same speed? So I'll let Margaret answer that. So one of the strengths of our elementary program in Hendrick Hudson is that we have a committed curriculum across grade levels across the three schools. And we've worked hard to get ourselves on the same page. The teacher teams on grade level work terrifically together. They are very cognizant of where they are, even in a normal school year where they still remain in their own building. So the goal, they understand the goal of remote instruction on the elementary level. They are aware that it may be a Frank G teacher who's assigned to that remote third grade class with students from all three schools. And they are absolutely ready to make sure that they are keeping pace with each other. Right, thank you. Um, there was one more. Oh, having having um, introductory meeting with students. Yeah, that's that's part of the intent of the phased-in model uh, is to provide that time and space um, without the pressures of a full day of instruction for that to happen. Um, that was feedback that uh, we received today from a, a number of grade levels at the elementary level. Margaret uh, Margaret Roller led conversations with many, many elementary teachers today, and, and they have that desire, and that would be part of uh, consideration into our final plan. Uh, number 28, we answered, and we've got a couple bulleted here. Uh, yes, Margaret answered that uh, same curriculum, same lesson plans. Yes, the idea is that as students, if a student leaves the classroom and goes remote, that um, they're not missing any instruction, that they're within uh, you know, same part of the module or same part of the curriculum. And as she mentioned, uh, we have a committed, a talented group of teachers that, that regularly collaborate. Uh, the status of the nurse position, uh, there are interviews. Uh, Lisa Shookman supervises that process. I know that um, both teams have, have interviewed a number of candidates and a, a decision is, I'm sure, forthcoming. Um, this one, uh, Laura and I, I know she already touched on it, but webinars offered to teach parents. Um, Laura, do you want to expand on that a little bit? Sure. I mean, it, it, as I said earlier, the tech coaches are creating opportunities for support for parents. So that will come in the form of pre-recorded tutorials and videos and how-to guides. And they will also will have office hours available for families to contact a tech coach after the school day or before the school day to get some support. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, students who start in person, we answered that. We've shi if we shift to a phase opening, will that reduce the number of instructional days? No, it won't. Uh, the governor has permitted online learning or the remote plan uh, to count, so we don't expect any, any changes uh, or any issues with that. Um, Will the days scheduled later in the year be made into regular instructional days? Yes, if we move professional development days from the end of the year and front load them as we're currently considering, yes, those would be instructional days and we would uh, provide a updated calendar for families. All right, good questions. Are there other ones, Greg, on the tabs? Is it PPE? Uh, okay, so um, besides increased social distancing precautions during physical education, indoor choir and band to make these activities more safe. Yeah, the, um, the recommendation is that those activities that, that take place without masks, that students are uh, at least 12 feet apart. Uh, this is a sea change for these groups of teachers. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, BOCES is taking the lead to provide staff development and training and some specialists uh, to work with teachers in that area. Um, instruction will look different. Uh, band rehearsals will look different. Um, it's just, it's, it's one of those uh, activities that a curriculum, you know, demands uh, use of, of breath and exuding uh, energy and, and uh, huffing and puffing. So um, we hope to address that regionally. Uh, we, we're certainly not unique in trying to address that. Uh, question two, COVID virus has been shown to spread by aerosols. Uh, will the spaces used for mask, mask breaks be well ventilated with outdoor air and will these spaces be clean? So the spaces will be cleaned every day and throughout the day. 
Uh, the mass breaks will really uh, depend on the number of students in the classroom at the same time. If there's a classroom that only has eight students, there'll be uh, opportunities within the classroom for those students to take a mass break and a, and a breather within the room. Uh, as we said yesterday, um, we're planning on uh, making sure all the windows open and for the windows that open that there are screens. That's uh, some purchases, uh, including the purchasing that, that we've had to make for this year to make sure everything is well ventilated. Is it clear the district is mandating masks and will enforce the policy? Social distancing rigorously enforced. If students are wearing masks, will they be required to maintain a six foot social distance? So the guideline is wear a mask or be socially distanced. Um, it will be difficult for any school to absolutely enforce both. And while parents can recommend or ask their children to wear a mask and we are providing an education where they're socially distanced, um, we know that there are also some concerns with prolonged mask wearing. So the guidance is where uh, uh, is to be socially distanced or wear a mask. Uh, depending on the layout of the classroom, uh, it's very likely that students will be socially distanced more than six feet. Um, but enforcing it will be um, it will be a challenge. It will be something that we uh, haven't had to do before. So while the guidance is is uh, clear that it's wear a mask or social distance on busing or on buses students will have to wear a mask we have, Okay, some other topics. We'll try to get through these so we can get to the questions uh, that have come in uh, Proper air ventilation and circulation uh, Anthony do you want to talk about air ventilation and circulation? I know you touched on it last night Right, and we talked about it a little bit earlier and what's going on and the things and the changes that we're making. Um, like I was speaking to earlier, um, at the Furnace Woods Elementary School, we're upgrading and changing our unit ventilators that are in each classroom. Um, we're working on our control systems district-wide to help out with the ventilation systems. We are um, increasing our exhaust in a lot of spaces um, where we're um, taking on new construction we're working on those systems as well um, so we are working on airflow in most of the buildings uh, in one way shape or form or the other great what about the the other question about merv 13 filters? yeah so the third the number four or the third question is the same thing uh, elaborating on hvac upgrades and the adding merv 13 and so which areas of the building so again uh, we had talked about a little earlier when you're changing from uh, a lower grade filter, MERV filter, to a higher grade MERV filter, there's constraints and uh, mechanical constraints and other considerations that have to be factored in. It's not just one for one. The filters are bigger, sometimes they're thicker, they don't fit into the same locations that the other filters were. Um, they restrict airflow inside the unit, so it's kind of counterproductive. You're trying to get more airflow into the building, and by using a higher filter, you're actually can actually can constrict it and reduce your filtering for one reason or the other. Um, so where we can, we are um, exploring with our engineers to increase our MERV filters to a higher rating. Uh, we are also are exploring um, installing HEPA filters to get better filtration in our buildings. We are also investigating needle point bipolar ionization, um, where we're going to install those in our HVAC equipment. And what that does is that eradicates um, microbials and, and bacteria that are forming in the air um, in one way, shape, or form or the other. Um, I know there's been some talk and things of that nature regarding um, UV lights. Um, we are restricted as to what we can and we can't do inside of our buildings from New York State Education Department. Um, they write the guidelines. Um, they've come back and said that they don't want to see certain things inside of our buildings. Um, UV lighting is one of those in certain applications, so we just have to be very careful and uh, consider these things when we do upgrade our HVAC systems and we put some of these uh, preventative measures in place. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, question three, if, my, if a student in my child's class tests positive, yes, this is the work of, of the County Health Department and contact tracing. 
Um, they will determine who will need to quarantine. They'll certainly uh, work with uh, the school district and we will be a communication arm with the Department of Health. Uh, for middle school students, if half or more or half of the families opt out for those students who are essential workers, can our children attend all four days rather than the proposed model? That's a really good question. Um, we're not sure right now. I think we need to wait to see what, uh, what the balance looks like between families that choose in school uh, and remote. Uh, we may be able to make that accommodation, but um, not, not on our radar at this time. Uh, question six is a, is a statement about wearing masks. They shouldn't be allowed. Uh, you, you punish girls and send them home for wearing too much, you should send children home. That's absolutely right. Um, children need to wear masks. Uh, we will enforce that. Um, I don't know, Lisa, if you want to talk about just some of the concerns around um, certain students that uh, may have a, a hard time wearing masks because of, uh, of other factors, if you want to discuss uh, what those conversations are. Yeah, so we've been actually talking about many students that may have asthma. Um, part of the guidance is that students that have medical conditions or emotional conditions that cannot permit them to wear masks or should be an alternative, whether it's a full face shield, whether it's um, a face shield that wraps around their face instead of just straight down. So it's really going to be dependent upon what that student can um, can handle, you know, in the hallway, something has to be worn. Uh, we do have some some protectors um, and dividers for classrooms that we would utilize, but it's really going to be expected that it's a case by case um, case by case determination. Great, thank you. And and there's a question uh, number ten while while you're while you're with us about. Um, reviewing our plans uh, with uh, epidemiologists, disease doctor. Can you can you share the conversations you've had with our um, school physician? Uh, yes. Okay. So um, we have a school physician. Uh, we we do consult with him. We actually are going to do a long meeting with him next week to do protocols and procedures to really make sure that it's a K twelve protocol protocol and procedures. So the school nurses and the school principals will be meeting with Dr. Soltran and going over processes and procedures, screening, um, screening process and procedures, working on a flow chart, an assessment piece, making sure we have a safe COVID room, and how do we handle students with just daily things, if you're diabetic or with medication, a little one needs an ice pack that we fell in love with me, what does that look like versus a student who um, does display some COVID, um, uh, you know, symptoms. So we uh, will have a full blown out meeting next week uh, with the doctor and the principals and the nurses will take charge of that and ensure that those documents are, are uh, developed and followed to as well. Great. Um, I, I want to focus real quick on question 11. I know we've talked about teacher input. Um, we've had many discussions with uh, the, the various union leaders uh, about their input. I know a lot of uh, different surveys went out and data was shared with us, but in particular, just real quick, Margaret, Lisa, and Laura, um, if you could just highlight one more time, I know you did last night at a board meeting, but the level of, in, of engagement and involvement that you're leading with groups of teachers around the reopening. Um, I'll, I'll, this is Laura Nair. I'll start. Um, again, uh, my meetings have been um, with HHEA. We have a standing meeting that we do weekly. We meet with the co-president to talk about their concerns and they represent the entire instructional staff and all HHEA members across all five buildings. Um, and so there's a lot of back and forth with that and support of, you know, again, frequently asked questions and they meet with their people and then they in turn meet with us. Um, regarding technology and instructional technology, like I've said, I've been working with a team of tech coaches from grades K through 12, also pretty much on a weekly basis, if not more. And I also have um, a data team made of tech technology coaches as well. And in all these conversations, my request has always been, please talk to your colleagues and then um, that's what they do. They get their feedback. They talk to their colleagues. They share with us 
the pros, the cons, and we make decisions in a collaborative fashion. Hi, this is Margaret. So my work with grade level or departments really remains focused on curriculum and instruction. And I would say as soon as we were getting close to closing in June, we immediately started to look forward to September and trying to get ourselves ready for gap closing, looking at curriculum uh, maps and figuring out how to infuse some of last year's work into the work that's coming in the, the year ahead for students. Um, we certainly talk all the time about what that looks like, what the planning needs to look like. We're now having meetings uh, to discuss scheduling, understanding that you know we all have the likelihood of being remote at any point in time and we need to bear that in mind as we create plans to move forward together. Next week I have a meeting with our grade level leaders at the elementary schools to talk a little bit deeply, more deeply about the proposals that have been made in the past two weeks with regard to a slower uh, or phased in entry and what does that mean for us and what are the best ways for us to reach out and connect with our kids as we're getting ready to come back. Um, this is Lisa Shepard again. So I actually overlap with Margaret as far as teaching wise. My special ed teachers will join her in her grade level meetings, but we also do specialized uh, team meetings. I meet with our grade level and IL for special ed, and again, very similar to Laura, we ask them to go back to talk to their teams, and you know, how else can we share information and make sure that we have everybody's input. Um, I also meet with the speech therapists, the OTs, the PTs. So we're always constantly having conversations about what would this look like, how does this happen. Um, I think with more minds together, it's easier to come up with a solution and try to do it in a silo. Um, you know, and, and I oversee several departments, as I shared earlier, the um, mental health team and the school counselors, they have been a huge part of summer planning with really getting ready for the SEL for, for staff and for students. Um, so that's my part. Great, thank you. Uh, the last batch of questions are really about process, about um, how we're trying to communicate and engage um, engage everyone with our planning and our thinking and a level of transparency. I'll first start with saying that every planning document is, is online and has been online for quite some time. We're updating those documents, we're providing resources from the county, the state, uh, and various agencies. Um, the purpose of yesterday's forum was to give a, an overview of the eight different areas uh, of planning, and you see them at, at the bottom of your screen, COVID, PPE, budget, etc. Uh, this conversation is certainly, we're, we're trying to achieve a, a little more Q&A and personalize it. Uh, we have another meeting on Monday, which we're going to use another, uh, another forum um, to try to personalize uh, this experience for everyone. The intent is not for it to feel like a lecture or that people are being talked at, uh, but we know there's a lot of information that folks want. Um, and while we've published it, we also know that folks want to have a conversation about it. So we're trying to use different methods and um, modes and methods to, to try to uh, be a little more, uh, provide a little more personal touch while, while we're remote and separated. So uh, we hope that today helped and um, bridge that gap a little bit uh, on Monday and subsequent meetings after Monday, whether it's talking about the, uh, the uh, remote plan or other meetings that we know are going to take place in the schools, um, that we're going to use other, other uh, platforms and technologies uh, to try to bring everyone together a little bit more. Certainly, it's, um, these are not ideal circumstances, and, and our goal is to try to provide as much information uh, as we can for parents. I know we wanted to try to uh, wrap up around 5.15, but we, we haven't gotten to some questions, and they're coming in. So we have about a dozen questions, and we're going to try to move quickly. Uh, Sarah Rubin sent three questions. Uh, one of them, are we off the non-compliance list? Yes, we are. I'd even say we were, we were never non-compliant. We received confirmation yesterday, and I, I talked about it at both meetings, um, that there appeared to have been an error with the Department of Health that has been uh, acknowledged and rectified. Does the community get to vote on a reopening plan? Um, as that was also discussed last night, um, the easy answer is no. And the answer, and the reason for that answer is the governor is, 
ask for schools uh, and administrative teams to make those decisions. We have a lot of decisions to make in a short period of time. Uh, and to try to canvas a vote uh, would just not be possible. Um, as you know, our, our budget vote last spring took place by mail-in ballot, and uh, we just we would not be able to put that together in a, in a safe way, nor do I even believe it's permitted. Why aren't we doing some form of education starting on the second? I don't uh, like neighboring districts. Uh, school districts have a first day of school. They, they vary. Some are the second, some are the eighth or ninth. Um, each district uh, uses or, or has a different approach um, to opening school. They have different contractual obligations that they have to make with their unions, uh, and um, as do we. So uh, while we considered uh, bringing uh, staff back on the second, uh, right now we're considering the phased-in approach where we bring staff in on the, uh, on the eighth and then go to our remote plan starting on the 14th. Uh, Janine Eichenholz has a question about, did the district engage or consult with medical professionals uh, in determining whether it's safe to open the school? So uh, Lisa talked about the work with our school physician. Um, the medical professionals with regards to whether it's safe to open schools. That's, a, that's a, a decision that the governor is holding right now. The governor said schools can be open, and that was his announcement on August 7th. He did say schools can be open in a number of fashions, remote learning, uh, a hybrid model. He didn't really care how schools open. He just said they will be open and that he has a calculation of when schools will be closed. So um, any medical professional advising us whether it's safe to open or not would be contrary to uh, basically the executive order power of, of the governor. Only the governor has the authority to close schools. Uh, let's see, Michelle Piccolo Hill has some questions. Um, if kids are assigned to a virtual teacher when remote, how will they be acclimated in, in February? Uh, we would start that conversation, as we said earlier, around Thanksgiving. We would try to identify families that may want to continue remote or not. Uh, but in a similar fashion that we're proposing the phased-in reopening of schools here, uh, we probably would have a similar opportunity for kids who started remote and desire to go back into school. We would create basically an orientation opportunity uh, for kids to get back into the rhythm and, and the new systems and structures of school. Uh, mask policy. We talked about mask policy. Um, Students are sitting at their desk during instruction. I'm concerned about poor ventilation. We talked about poor ventilation, and we talked about the guidance that uh, mask wearing is mandatory when you cannot socially distance. Um, enforcing a mask policy with students uh, sitting at a desk is, is something that is uh, not recommended. Certainly it's permitted. Uh, that's not really a discussion we've had. Uh, if parents wish to um, have their students wear masks at all times, um, that certainly is a, is a family decision, but our guidance uh, from multiple health-related uh, organizations are uh, six feet, social distance, or wear a mask. Uh, we talked about, uh, explain a little bit more of what already has been implemented in terms of filtration and ventilation. Um, Anthony Merlini talked about that today. Uh, he mentioned at our board meeting uh, a number of, of matters. I don't know, Anthony, if you want to just talk real quickly about uh, additional filtration and, and ventilation. Um, you know, I know we, we talked earlier about uh, new filters and ion generators and a, a lot of different proposals that uh, some aren't even state approved yet. Um, the guidance is to open windows and to open doors and open the hatch on the, uh, uh, on the school bus to increase ventilation. Uh, sample schedules, yes, we're going to have sample schedules for, for the elementary virtual model. We're actually working on that uh, tomorrow, but as Margaret Roller explained, it's going to be a, a, a movement between whole group, small group, and individual instruction, but there will be an expectation that students are engaged throughout the day with their teacher uh, and their peers. Will the deadline for the virtual request be pushed back? Um, it may. Uh, what we want to do is make sure that we have our school-based conversations first with families. Uh, the idea is, is we want to have an understanding of families 
uh, who are seriously considering it so we can make some uh, staffing determinations because as we said earlier if we have a number of uh, families who decide to stay home uh, that will um, certainly impact our staffing. Uh, another question we received from Emily Pedersen, are parents going to be notified if someone tested positive? Yes, you will. The school district will play a role in notifying you, but also uh, the Department of Health uh, will play a role in that as well. And the question about uh, will there be a remote model in the 1211 class? Certainly that's a, a parental decision, but also students have uh, IEPs and um, they have specific goals and objectives that we try to meet on those IEPs and uh, not all of them may be attained through a remote model so those are going to be individual conversations that um, our special ed staff will have with families. A uh, question from Alex Philbin, if we elect to start, start in school and move to remote are we committing to that decision for the rest of the first semester? Um, right now, yes, that's the plan, um, and again, to make sure that we don't have a free flow of kids um, coming and going from remote into the classroom, uh, but maybe I, maybe I read that wrong. So we commit, if we elect to start in school and then move to remote, so I'm sorry, if you elect to start in school, uh, certainly a remote uh, option is available to you. Uh, special ed uh, question from Jennifer Fleming. Can high school special ed students go in for more classroom learning more than twice a week? Uh, Lisa, do you want to you take that? Because I know uh, part of our intent is for uh, special ed students to attend um, more than just in the hybrid model. Right. Um, I'm leaving, you know, Mr. Mack is going to do his best to ensure students can go in four days a week. Everybody's going to be remote on Wednesday. Um, but again, that's going to depend on the schedule. We are trying to make sure that um, students get as much face-to-face -face time as possible. Uh, we know that that face-to-face -face time is extremely important. So as soon as we have the schedule from the high school, we can definitely have further conversations with them. Great. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from, from Fred, from Iceman Fred. Will there be a test run? Uh, to make sure everyone is up and running. It looks like that's for uh, remote learning. Work out all the bugs before the first day. Yes, uh, that's the intent of making sure that we have a significant block of time to start the year um, to practice these things. Um, the first day of instruction that we envision in the remote model is going to be a lot of expectation, expectation setting as well as uh, getting to know your students, so on and so forth. Um, we know the model works because we did it last year. All of the software uh, has been tested, has been vetted. We've been using it. We've been using that software over the summer, so certainly we feel confident. Uh, but yes, we'll, we'll uh, make sure all the bugs are worked out accordingly. Uh, AC in classrooms. Um, in classrooms in K-5 where mask wearing, mask wearing may be an issue, can portable AC units be rented or purchased for rooms that are especially hot? There are rooms that sometimes have uh, temperatures of 80 degrees or warmer and wearing a mask is a bad mix. So I know that's a, a conversation uh, we're having with different vendors about uh, temporary air conditioning units and uh, making sure that uh, we try to reduce the temperature. Uh, increased ventilation will help um, and there may be days because of mask wearing, and this is a you know a, a really good point that it may be too hot for both. It may be too hot for students to be in school and wearing a mask, and that will be a decision we'll have to make in conjunction with uh, health department officials. That that is one of the many reasons, and and uh, one of the many growing uh, unforeseen reasons um, that we may need to move to a remote model very quickly. It's also uh, one of the reasons why uh, delaying the start of in-school instruction uh, will help. It will buy us some time with some very unseasonably hot September weather, which it's, um, it's commonplace for the lower Hudson Valley. So thank you, uh, thank you for that question. Um, from Kathleen Corgan, if the district is able to finalize in-person teaching and schooling plans, 
for what would be the original 2020 start of the school year just after Labor Day? What is the construction status in each school? And would each school be ready to open on time given any construction? So I'll let Anthony Merlini talk about that. The question is basically um, a status on our construction project. Sure. Uh, right now we're in a critical phase of our construction. This week and next week are going to be two pivotal weeks. Um, obviously tomorrow's Friday, so we have one more day this week, and next week's going to be the big push. So depending on what happens over these next this next week and a day, um, we'll, we'll see where we are then, and we can better determine how we're going to be shaping up for when school starts. As of right now, there was a big push this week. I saw a lot more happening inside the buildings. I saw a lot more workers, a lot more crews. Uh, and then next week, like I said, I got to see what happens next week, and that's going to dictate. But if all goes well and we stay on the same track that we had started this week, we should be in line to have a good percentage of everything completed um, by the time school starts. We do know that there are going to be certain um, things that won't be completed, or auditoriums won't be up and running 100%. Um, but we don't have plans to really use them right now because we don't have anything where we can have. Um, large groups of individuals inside of auditoriums. Um, so there's long lead items that go into the auditoriums and there's big things that happen inside of auditoriums in terms of construction. Um, so those are on the tail end of things. Um, but the other parts and pieces, uh, if things go well, we should be all right. Great. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, Michelle Piccolo Hill with an additional question. She apologizes for an additional question. Will seniors who opt for virtual receive same level of support from guidance counselors in their college planning? Um, I know that was a, a is a concern uh, among um, our high school principal as well as Lisa Shookman who works closely with the counselors. Uh, one of the goals or, or one of the um, additional byproducts or benefits of the phased in approach would give the school counselors um, a good pocket of uninterrupted time to work directly with their seniors. Um, last year, the way the school ended and SATs were canceled and ACTs and Regents exams, uh, there was a lot of angst and anxiety around what that meant for college applications. And many of those universities have made some uh, pretty aggressive uh, and student-centered decisions since. Uh, but Lisa, I'll, I'll let you chime in real quick. Um, I mean, there is no uh, there is no reason that uh, seniors who are remote will not have access or will have less access to their counselors, but Lisa, I'll let you chime in a little bit. Actually not. I mean, the seniors should have just as much access as anyone does, whether remote or in school. Um, it's as quick as a Google Meet. Um, if parents feel comfortable, I'm sure the student could come in and meet with them face to face as well. But that's something that we can definitely address once we figure um, the schedule and we start phase and I'm sure the counselors will make sure that the seniors are first on their list in order to um, meet with them and make sure that there's the meeting with, uh, either monthly or bi-monthly to ensure they're prepping for college and college applications. Great. Thank you. Um, we have, let's see, is uh, from Michelle. Is Hendrick Hudson moving forward with the phased in approach or are you still deciding? If still deciding, when will that decision be so parents can plan accordingly? So um, things are moving quickly in education. Uh, yesterday, Suffren from across the river decided to implement this model. Today, New Rochelle implemented this model. Uh, schools in Dutchess County have implemented this model. There is a discussion tomorrow with the county executive of Westchester County. Um, to get his thoughts and input on, uh, if not a county-wide approach, but at least uh, supporting um, an approach like this. So, you know, our, our the intention, our best intentions, um, th things move and change, and we need to adapt and adjust accordingly. Our school calendar, uh, as is, was was decided upon last February before any of this happened, and. You know, that's what is so anxiety producing and, and is making us um, really nervous that the institution that we have always relied on, public school, um, isn't there. It's not there the way that we knew it. And it's new to everybody. The, the, your questions and your concerns um, are genuine and, and they're so on point and they're with a level of specificity 
that perhaps we don't have all those answers right now because we are building that system. Uh, if this was a normal year, parents would absolutely have every confidence with what was happening. We know when ninth and sixth grade orientations are happening and athletics and getting your instrument, all of those things, all of those uh, consistent features of gearing up for a school year uh, are gone. And if they're not gone, they're on pause. Our athletic, our, our student athletes are waiting for guidance to see if they can play. Um, it, it, everything's up in the air and uh, it's stressful for everyone and we're trying to move quickly, we're trying to move thoroughly, uh, but things are moving quick. Uh, so a decision, when will a decision be made? We hope to make one uh, by tomorrow. We shared some of those target dates with you. Uh, we want to have another conversation uh, with our administrative team to see if those dates will work or if we need to move some things around. I know that when this was initially discussed yesterday that October 5th was a, a slap in the face um, because who starts school in, in October? But the idea would be all students would start remote in September. And, and Laura, uh, our, our team had a meeting earlier today, and Laura, you, you calculated the number of instructional days, is that correct, from a, a proposed phasing model to a, uh, I guess, to a regular year model? Do you still have that in front of you? Yes, traditionally, if we were to start um, in a regular school year, September would be 16 instructional school days. If we were to take four days for professional development, we would reduce that by four to 12 instructional days. So again, normally we have 16 instructional days in the month of September, and we're looking to reduce it to 12. Okay. Uh, we've got one more question, and then we're going to we're going to wrap up. Um, the question is about uh, polycarbonate desk shields, uh, that they do meet the guidelines of New York State Fire Code, they are allowed. Uh, Lisa, you have even ordered some of these, is that correct? I have. I've actually ordered quite a few, although we're, we're negotiating a, a shipping charge, but yeah, there's quite a few that are going to be ordered that will disperse to the building. And then if we two moving forward, yes, we have to work together to see what else needs to be ordered. Right. So, so the polycarbonate shield meets the SED requirement, but my understanding, depending on how many you put in and what you put in, you still have to write a letter to SED to l let them know, to acknowledge that you're going to be using these things inside your buildings. Um, can you use that instead of, uh, in lieu of a mask? From what I understand, depending on the um, relationship to other individuals, your social distancing, etc., you still have to wear a mask. So the, the polycarbonate shield does not give you any kind of abatement towards aerosols coming into your area or you emitting aerosols out of you. So the mask, what the mask is supposed to do is it's supposed to protect the rest of the occupants inside the room from the aerosol coming from you, so your mask is actually protecting everyone else. So if you're not wearing a mask and you're emitting it, you're still emitting an aerosol, so you potentially could be infecting others where they're protecting you by wearing a mask. Great, thank you. And uh, two last questions uh, from VS. Uh, Margaret, I'll let you take these. I'll read both of them and then you can answer both. Uh, the first question is, will there be iReady tests at the beginning of the year? And also from VS, um, what time period will be allocated at the beginning of the year to potentially make up from lost learning last spring? So yes, we will be doing our us usual benchmark assessment. We actually discussed that today and how it would play out. So that would involve iReady and the in-person reading assessments that are done every year, three times a year. Uh, what was the second question again? Uh, will there be time at the beginning of the year, you know, to refresh and? Well, well, yeah. So our teachers met vertically in the month of June to talk about where, for argument's sake, second grade left off and how third grade might want to begin. Uh, the best practice around that is not to start where second grade left off, but to look at the topics that second grade may have missed or not had enough time to focus on and figure out where they fit in the third grade curriculum. 
And then, if, you know, if I left off with measurement and I'm not really certain that my students internalized it, then the next grade would look at where that topic comes up and backtrack when they get to that unit. But not to start third grade wherever second grade finish. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, of course, we blew through our allotted time. I know um, many of our team members have other functions and meetings they need to get to. Uh, we appreciate your participation. I think our, our top number of viewers tapped at about 108 or 130. 130, that's great. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, and, and I'll just leave you with... Um, we, we hear you. We hear you loud and clear. We're trying to do our best uh, to create a more personal and personalized conversation with everybody. Uh, we don't want anyone to feel that they're being talked to or talked at or lectured. Um, you know, in a normal situation, uh, myself or any of our team members would buzz around the PTA meetings um, or, or host, you know, different events or opportunities for Q&As. We're just uh, we're not there, and this is um, a new experience for all of us, and we're trying to meet everyone's needs while following some new guidelines. Um, this comes at a, at a critical juncture of, of a significant sea change in our profession, and we understand that it's a sea change in your lives, and uh, that is not lost upon us. Um, our team is trying its best uh, to keep everyone informed and engaged and uh, we, we know that you understand that and we're trying to improve our practices uh, in how we engage with you and keep you informed. So uh, we hear you loud and clear, message received. Uh, we have another forum on Monday at uh, 6 p.m. Uh, we very well may have a, a different mode of communicating with you, so look out for that. Uh, and still um, feel free to submit your questions. We're going to uh, take these and, and if they're not already on our FAQ, we'll add them. Uh, but we appreciate your input. We appreciate your concern. Um, this is a, a really dynamic uh, and stressful time in, in, in our community, in our country's history. Um, but we will get through it. We'll get through it together and, and uh, keeping everyone informed and in the loop. So I appreciate your time. Appreciate the time of our administrative team for joining us. And uh, we will see you next Monday at 6 p.m. And please uh, continue to shop on our website for any updates or new information that